Coyote's Corner alongside Dave Vest. I'm Luke Lipinski here with a, a little bit of a off-season update for you. There's been quite a bit going on here, Dave. It, it doesn't really feel like a, like a down period at all. We're middle of May, and, and there's Coyote's news seemingly every couple of days right now. Yeah, certainly, Luke. Lots to talk about, lots for the fans to know as we go into the dog days of summer. Uh, no pun intended, of course, with coyotes and dogs i know that's I'm keeping track of all your puns on this podcast what's the over under for this podcast? nine and a half and i have the strong over on that one <laughs> i think over might be the way to go well it, it took you 10 seconds to get the first one in uh i noticed on nhl on the nhl network last week we're in the second round of the playoffs there was a lot of coyotes talk shane Doan was on the last uh, couple days of the week uh even through the weekend a little bit i thought he did great we'll, we can get to that when we talk about Doan a little bit but also the first part of the week the coyotes stole the show there too Not just by announcing their new GM, but announcing kind of an innovative way to to run things here. And I got to say, for the most part, uh, people that that know hockey, that follow hockey within hockey circles, I thought it was received very, very well across the uh, across the entire continent. Absolutely. I agree. It was quite a week around here. Very historic week in terms of uh, professional sports. John Chaika, obviously, is who we're talking about, named the eighth general manager in the history of the Coyotes slash Jets franchise, John, 26 years old. He's the youngest person ever to be the general manager of one of the four major sports teams. It's pretty cool. It's hard to say, but it's really it, cool. It is. Once you get it out there, it's uh, it's pretty cool. I mean, you start to – Theo Epstein's name was brought up a lot, obviously. He's had a lot of success at the, at the Major League Baseball level, and he, I believe he was 28 when he started – I, I like this move. I really do. I, I know that I, somebody like myself who's this closely associated with the team saying that maybe doesn't hold as much water as some guy from TSN saying it, but they were all saying it too. Uh, but internally, I just – the way the Coyotes are going about it where Dave Tippett's going to have a lot of influence and there's going to be a lot of that open communication and, and Chaika himself, something that really appeals to me about him, and it's something that I don't understand why this doesn't happen more. He's – he said this in his press conference. He, he's going to be labeled an analytics guy. That's just the way it's going to be because that's how he's known right now. Uh, and he knows his analytics, obviously. That's how he got to this point. But he also played hockey. I mean, he didn't play in the NHL, but he played hockey. And he seems to have that balance of analytics are important, but there's also other stuff that's important. And it's and I think about a guy like Charles Barkley, and he's just kind of the face of it in the NBA, but it's, it's not just him. It, everybody seems to fall in these categories of you, it has to be 100% analytics or 100% not. Obviously, the answer is down the middle, and, and he not only does he get that, but he's a sharp guy that, that everybody speaks very highly of. And you, have, you and I have met him, too. I mean, he's, he's going to be a sharp, aggressive GM. That's what you need. I was impressed with what Dave Tippett said about John. Dave Tippett didn't say a lot at the press conference. He wasn't asked a lot of questions. But when he spoke, I mean, he had some very impactful comments about John, called him very intelligent. He labeled him a difference maker. Um, you know, Dave Tippett also, we should mention, he's going to have an expanded role in the hockey operations department, he's executive vice president. In addition to being head coach for the next five years, yeah. Oh, well, yeah. by the way, that was just tossed in there. I mean, to get a five-year extension as an NHL head coach, NHL head coaches don't usually even last five years. It's a testament to what Dave Tippett has done through a lot of unique circumstances up to this point. I think it's going to be a nice combination with what John Chica brings to the table, what we know Dave Tippett brings to the table, and also it was mentioned that. The team is still looking to bring in another member, high-ranking member of the hockey ops, an assistant GM. And the the phrase we heard over and over was it would be an experienced NHL management person. Yeah, Gary Drummond, the president of hockey operations, too. And it's it's adding the the sort of assistant experienced GM in there that I think is the innovative part. I think people just hear you have a 26-year-old GM. Oh, that's innovative. What is? I mean, based on his background, but I think the the part that makes this work is you have John Chaika, and then you have Dave Tippett with influence, and then you're going to have another guy probably that's been around this league for a long time that just simply, you know, he knows the ins and outs of making trades with other GMs, and he just because he's got the experience there. I mean, there are certain areas that that experience is really going to come in handy, and to find that sort of balance, and I think having Chaika and Tippett right at the press conference sitting right next to each other speaking very highly of each other is very symbolic of the balance because in a way you've got you know again you're just going by labels that people are going to see nationally you've got the young analytics guy and then the old school coach who anybody that has met Dave Tippett is going to tell you he knows more about hockey than pretty much anybody else they've met 
A lot of great quotes coming out of the press conference. As I mentioned, Dave Tippett speaking highly of John Chica. John spoke very well. I thought he handled himself extremely well. Uh, everyone involved did so too. Uh, one comment that John made that really stuck with me, and I'm going to read it to you here as I have it in front of you, uh, me and you. Well, uh, I can't see it, but yeah, good enough. This is John speaking, and I love this remark. Quote, we don't need to make 10 moves. We need to find those one or two special opportunities and be prepared to execute on them. That's our goal. What do you think? I I like it because in talking to people that that don't work for the team, that just live in the Valley, that I know just whether from – playing rec league hockey or I just know that are fans of the Coyotes but obviously aren't you know close with the team they just they know the team and they follow it I think there was a I don't want to say apprehension but kind of wonder when you're switching GMs how crazy are we going to get because you got a lot of good prospects I mean this is not the team of a couple of years ago this is a team that's that's set talent wise in a lot of a lot of areas not there yet you got to make some moves but you know you don't want to you don't want to shake things up too much now when you've got pieces just for the sake of shaking it up you know you you could have a guy come in here and say hey i'm the new gm i'm 26 years old we're going to totally reinvent the wheel here we're going to bring in five six seven guys we're going to trade this guy we're going to promote this guy he said exactly the opposite you know there was just a certain calmness and stability and yet at the same time a very precise plan of action and i thought it was very uh interesting and fascinating that after the press conference, which ended right around lunchtime, uh, you know, John did his uh, interviews with us and with national media on the phone and TV. And then right to lunch with Shane Doan yep. to talk, you know, and get a sense of where Shane is as far as coming back. And I just found that incredibly um, – what's the word I'm looking for? Um, well, it was his effective. first order of business. Yeah, yeah very efficient. Just, efficient. You know, now I've done my press conference. I've been announced as the youngest GM in professional sports history. I'll do these quick interviews. I'll even talk to Dave Vest, which I thought was very nice of him. And i got to go have this lunch with Shane Doan because let's figure out where we are. You know, right. uh, Shane Doan has got to be priority probably number one. Uh, and, and I mentioned there's not much of an off season for the Coyotes. You, bring in, you've, you don't bring in a new GM. I think this is another key that kind of gets lost in shuffle. He's been here this last year. Correct. Not only does he get it. He's not a new guy coming in, like you said, trying to put his stamp on this team. His stamp's already on this team. He's been here for a year. He's, he, he knows the ins and outs of this organization and the personnel. But, yeah, to then go have uh, lunch with Shane Doan and you know, I, mean, we, I would assume we're going to get closer to having Shane Doan back, which obviously everybody wants, and it sounds like Shane Doan might want that too. Getting Shane back, number one on the list. Um, and then right after that, or soon after all of this, if you look at the calendar, the off-season calendar, we have the draft combine coming up at the end of May, and then the draft. So John doesn't have a lot of time here to decorate his office. Yeah, no, he's <laughs> he's got to decorate the roster. See what I did there? Nice. Uh, the Coyotes will pick seventh in the draft. Um, I guess we really haven't talked about the draft lottery so much on this this podcast well there's not a lot to say the coyotes went to toronto with the seventh pick and then if you look at the math and what was supposed to happen and what could have happened pretty much what was supposed to happen happened yeah. that is they left the draft lottery with, with the seventh pick right didn't drop didn't climb um i understand the feeling from fans of the number one pick's going to be a guy from scottsdale he's he's our guy so you want to have him here I thought this was a definitely a, a different feel, and I, I, I know you, you pointed this out at the draft that the only other Coyote's seventh overall pick was Shane Doan. That, that worked out pretty well. Yeah. Um, the Coyotes weren't one of the worst teams this year. So while it would have been nice to have Austin Matthews, I don't feel like this team missed out because they didn't get that pick because, like you said, they weren't supposed to. They're, they're, they're not one of the worst teams. They're right. on the way up. Uh, and if you look at this draft, and I'm sure you and I will probably do another one of these closer to the draft, there's some pretty good players in that top seven, eight, maybe nine spots, depending what the teams in front of the Coyotes take. And, and to me, if I'm drafting at seven, I've got a list of seven guys that I absolutely want because I know at least one of them is going to drop to me because picking in the top seven. And there are some real nice pieces for the Coyotes there uh, that could help them out. And don't forget, they have two first-round picks after seven, of course. Yes, <laughs> not if, before seven. <laughs> if I'm any judge of math and Here's numbers. a big reveal. They also pick third. No. Picking 20th, yep. uh, courtesy of the trade with the Rangers that brought Anthony Duclair here and sent Keith Yandel to New York. So two picks in the top 20. That trade worked out pretty well. Who knows? There could be some trades between now. Oh, yeah. Teams moving up, moving down. That happens all the time. So we'll see. But as of today, schedule to take 7th and number 20. That's pretty good. And very possibly, depending on how things go, two picks in the second round. Um, 
you, know, you always hear when you talk to, to GMs around this league, really in any sport, but especially in the NHL, you want to have options. And when you've got three or four picks in the first two rounds, again, I mean, how many times have the Coyotes done this where they've had, they've stockpiled these high picks and they've picked well now lately here too. Uh, it just, you're right. It gives you options. You could trade a couple of those picks. If, if there's a established player out there that fits what you need. And all of a sudden that's a trade that helps another team that maybe has that established player, but they need picks. I'm thinking of quite a few teams actually out there that don't have the picks because the Coyotes have them all. And you could help yourself without giving up any actual players. So you still keep your, your young core of prospects and probably even still a couple picks uh, intact. Or worst, worst case, you just you, you pick at 7-20, and 20 and there's nothing wrong with that either. NHL draft last weekend of June. It's in Buffalo, New York. The combine starts May 30th. That's also in Buffalo. So it's a big uh, month for Buffalo. Lots of wings. And the NHL. So moving on. Wow. I thought I was going to segue. Go for All it. All right. Moving on. Well said. Uh, thank you. I learned that from the best. The, uh, the potential of having an AHL team in Tucson is looking more and more real by the day. It sure is. We could do a whole podcast on that and the benefits of it. But just you know, briefly summing up what's going on here is uh, the news of the week. On Tuesday of this week, the American Hockey League Board of Governors unanimously approved the sale of the Springfield Falcons to the Coyotes and also the re- relocation of that team from Springfield, Massachusetts to Tucson, Arizona. Now, yes. all of this is you know predicated on approval uh, by the city of Tucson. There has to be a lease for the arena down there. Still some hurdles left for this to happen, but it's looking real good. I mean, yeah. that was a big one, getting the approval of the BOG. Unanimously, too, as you pointed out. I, I like, that's like the, the, the NBA voters voting Steph Curry unanimous. It has that much more of a ring to it as, a, as the MVP. The end goal here being that the Coyotes will have their affiliate 115 miles down I-10. They would play in the AHL's Pacific Division with a lot with a of the other California teams, right? Yeah, the affiliates for the California NHL teams. It's it's all, you know, coming together nicely. Makes a lot of sense. You're right. We can sit here and we can talk about the benefits for an hour, um, but just real quickly, it benefits the AHL because, as we just said, they started basically a Pacific style division of a lot of California teams last year. Why not have another team right here? Uh, it certainly benefits the Coyotes. The, the very just simple things that maybe you don't think of of. You know, we got a guy that might not be able to play tonight um, just as a sort of an insurance thing. We'll call a guy up from the AHL team. He's not flying 2,700 miles to get here. He's an hour and a half away by car, you right. know. Uh, so it just gives you options there. You can, you know, same thing with a goalie. If you need to call a goalie up, the benefits for the Coyotes, and uh, I think they're pretty self-evident. But I kind of put myself in the position of a Coyotes fan. Uh, or even just a, 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 a citizen of Tucson. They don't have a, a, a pro sports team. Now. Of any kind. Yeah, which is crazy when you think about how big Tucson yeah. is. So now you're going to get an AHL team that's going to be loaded with some good prospects. It's not just going to be an AHL team. It's going to be a pretty good AHL team. If I live in Tucson, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about this because I can embrace this as our team. Sure. And look, if you get attached to one or two of those players and, they, and they're good and they get called up to the Coyotes – just drive up the street and watch them play in the NHL. That's, right. that's a cool situation to have. And just expanding ice hockey in general beyond the Phoenix metropolitan area within the state of Arizona. I mean, I think that's huge. You know, we want the state of Arizona to become a, a hockey hotbed. We always say how it isn't one. But if you all of a sudden now have an NHL team and an AHL team, you know, I think that can only serve – well, the gr- growing of the sport here in the state, it's certainly something that uh, it, it's just one of many advantages to this relationship becoming a reality. And flip side, even if you're a Coyotes fan that lives in Scottsdale and you want to see so and so play next year, you know, it's, it's a, the Coyotes are on the road or whatever, and you just want to run down the street. It's, it's, you can drive down there and back in the same day. It's, it's a good all around situation, like you said. And I got to say, you know, ownership came in and they were and, and they they said a lot of good things. If we can do this to build the sport in in uh, in the valley and in, in Arizona in general, outside of just the Coyotes, just building the sport of hockey. But they're following through with it and they're doing it. Anybody can say it. They've been doing it. This isn't the only example, but this is a big one. I, yeah. I can tell you, even just from playing, just pick up hockey around Phoenix. I play hockey with a lot of people from Tucson who don't have anywhere to play in Tucson, so they're making the drive up to Phoenix at. 
you know, to play hockey at 11 o'clock on a Monday night or whatever, because this is their only option, you got to figure with an AHL team down there, eventually they're going to have places to play down there too if you're just a fan of hockey. That is the very definition of growing the sport. Next step, as I mentioned, in this process is getting a deal worked out with the city council of Tucson. Uh, that could happen very quickly here, perhaps before this month is over, but maybe a little later uh, in the summer is the more likely scenario. But we'll be watching that from afar and hopefully have that to talk about on the next podcast. Maybe even throw out some uh, personal preferences for team names. Don't want to get too far ahead, Ooh, though. That's, I didn't even think of that yet. Okay, i got some time to, to plan that one out. Uh, World Championships, got some Coyotes over yeah. there. Have you been watching? I have been watching. I was pleasantly surprised that they're on NBC Sports. Well, the Team USA games pretty much exclusively. Yes. Which works out well because obviously, uh, well, maybe not obviously, but Connor Murphy Uh, An American, plays for the Coyotes, of course. He is playing for Team USA and playing well. He's averaging over 20 minutes a game. I think it's second highest on the team. Uh, They've played three games. They've lost two of the three, uh, but they've been in the games. They lost to Canada and Finland. I mean, they weren't playing like some pickup team that they found in somewhere in, in Europe. Sure. And Murphy was named an alternate captain, which I found very uh, impressive on, on that team. The American team is a young team. Let's, it is. Let's, you know, let's not sugarcoat it. Uh, there's a lot of young players on that team. They probably won't win the gold, but, you know, I could see them getting in for a bronze, maybe a silver. You've got uh, Connor Murphy, Austin Matthews, who we mentioned earlier. He's the He's the big star forward on the team. But yeah. uh, I, I think they'll win some more games. As you mentioned, they've already played Canada and Finland, the favorites to win their group. Yeah, it's it's an interesting setup when you look at some of the teams have the best of the best, the guys that have been playing in the NHL for 15 years on their team, and that's fine. But it's all what you want to get out of it. But from even just from Team USA's perspective, you got this young group of guys coming up, and it's cool from a Coyotes perspective to see that they acknowledge Connor Murphy as one of the leaders of that young group. Who knows? You know, maybe this sets the stage for the World Cup a couple years down the line. This is the next wave of, of American players, and it is really uh, encouraging to see Connor, Mo- Connor Murphy right at the top of that group in terms of leadership. And it just speaks to the leadership, again, that the Coyotes have in their locker room. Yeah. When you talk about Shane Doan and Oliver ekman Larson and, and some of the other vets, but then obviously you talk about Max Domi, you got to talk about Connor Murphy. He's an alternate captain for his country's national yeah, team. Exactly. That's a huge honor. I mean, we can't understate that. And you mentioned Max Domi. He's also playing in the World Championship. He's playing for Team Canada, which is loaded yeah. uh, with star NHL players. Corey Perry, Matt Duchesne, to name a few. Yeah, Brad uh, Marchand, Brendan Gallagher. I mean, yeah, very established NHL star players. So Max is playing a lesser role on that team as he did for the Coyotes. Uh, he's playing about 10 minutes a game. He hasn't scored, but I've seen him out there. I know he's playing. Yeah. And, and he's, he's trying to create plays on the fourth line. And you get something. This is – there's two different ways to look at having your players play for a, a, a national team. Like, I know there are some teams that are a little hesitant when the Olympics fall in the middle of the season, and you're like, okay, I wouldn't mind if my best players got to rest here before the stretch run. But something like this where you've got young players that are playing in the world championships, you know, training camp's not for a few months, so – they're going to get rest after this. But for guys like Max Domi and Connor Murphy, and Tobias Reeder, this is a great experience for them. You're almost getting extra development out of your young players in the offseason. You mentioned that some of the guys Max Domi's playing with, I mean, he's playing with some of the best of the best right. in Canada right now. Connor McDavid, we forgot him. Yeah, he's decent. He's not bad. There's a lot of Connors in the NHL now. And you mentioned uh, Tobias Reeder. He's playing for Germany. One goal, one assist in three games. He's playing for his idol. Uh, Marco Sturm, he's yeah. the head coach of Team Germany, so I'm sure readers having a good time. I, I think the young guys are the ones that really benefit the most from this. You know, it, we've seen Washington a couple of years where Ovechkin goes over after. He's going over again. Yeah, it, that doesn't shock me. And I understand, I mean, there's there's a lot of, you know, he wants, I think Ovechkin just wants to keep playing hockey best second round of the playoffs. Plus it's in Russia. Yes. I'm sure that has something to do with it. But I don't think Washington looks at it like, oh, okay, well, Ovechkin will finally take the next step. Like, he's he's established. He is what he is. He's the best pure goal score in the NHL, but for guys like Domi and Reader and Murphy, they're getting better. They're playing with the best of the best against some of the best of the best, and they're they're getting better, so it's a win-win. We'll keep an eye on that as it unfolds. A couple more weeks. They're still in the pre- preliminary round games. Sorry, I have to go very slowly when I say that word. Hey, I don't know why you're using all these multi-syllabic words. Prelim round. Pre- Ooh, look at that. You shortened it. Uh, the OHL playoffs, a couple yes. more future Coyotes getting some good exposure and experience. Yeah, we've been tracking the prospects all season long, and uh, there's only two who are still playing. Um, Christian Dvorak is playing for the London Knights in the Ontario Hockey League, and Brendan Perlini 
is playing for the Niagara Ice Dogs, also in the uh, Ontario Hockey League. And as fate would have it, they're playing each other, those teams, for the, the championship. championship. Yeah. Winner gets to go to the Memorial Cup. But London's up uh, 3 nothing right now. London's been on an absolute terror. You and oh, I were looking at the stats. Unreal. Twelve. Well, they've won 12 games in a row. 12 playoff games yeah. in a row. 12 playoff games in a row. And um, the line for London, the top line, which Dvorak centers, it's yes. him, Matthew Kachuk, the son of Keith Kachuk. Who has yet to be drafted. And Mitch Marner, who was drafted last year. Right after Dylan Strome by Toronto. So go ahead. I can't even bring myself to say it. So they've now played. London has played 17 games in these playoffs. Where they, they're 15-2 and two in the playoffs. Uh, in those 17 games, those three have combined for 117 points. That's just crazy. It's unreal. I can't believe it. You're sitting there smiling. We both want to laugh. These I sound mean, like basketball numbers. <laughs> it's just crazy. And, you know, the, and taking nothing away from Niagara. I mean, they've had a great season. They entered the playoffs. I believe they won nine games in a row. Yeah. In the they swept a couple of teams out of the playoffs. They're having a tough time against London. But I think, you know, some NHL teams might. They, they really, and we should point out. I mean, there were other guys. Uh, Ryan McKinnis took a huge step for the Coyotes' development this season. He was playing in Kitchener. Uh, Kyle Wood it was in North Bay. They, they, I think, they went out in the second round. Dylan Strom, who, who <laughs> Erie ran into that buzzsaw known yeah. as London right now in the third round. So Dylan Strom had another strong showing. Uh, it's we talk about the prospects the Coyotes have a lot because they have an absurd amount. Like there's not another yeah. NHL team saying, well, our, our number three and our number four prospect are playing in the second round. And then our one and our two are playing in the championship. It's a, uh, it's a good situation to be in. And uh, you know, there's other players on that London team that are going to be high draft picks this year. O, uh, Ole Ulevi on defense. I don't know if the Coyotes will take any of these guys, but they're guys that are projected right in that range. You mentioned Matthew. Kuchak. Yeah. He's projected fourth. Yeah. I mean, who knows if it'll be fourth, fifth, third, yeah. uh, at the, at the draft, it seems to be the top three, and, um, and then about five other guys. Yeah, so and you, Levy, and Kachuk are in that next five, and the so, Coyotes will pick in that next five. So it appears London's headed for the Memorial Cup. That'll be fun to watch uh, for uh, Dvorak. We know Henrik Samuelsson played in the Memorial Cup two years played ago, very well, in the and Memorial they won Cup too. Yeah, and he was the reason why. He was the main reason why. Sure. They won that. Um, so the we'll, Memorial Cup's usually on on the NHL Network. If I, I believe I, so. Yeah. yeah, it's up in Red Deer this year. It starts on the nineteenth. So just something to keep on the radar or back burner or the back burner of the radar. The back radar, the burning radar. There you, you go. probably at least get to see Christian Dvorak. Uh, but if not, then you're getting to watch Brendan Perlini. You're getting to see somebody that's pretty high up in the Coyote system. How about the NHL playoffs? How about them? We uh, wow, you got real serious. <laughs> well, I know where this is going. Well, it's I an mean, ode to the Pittsburgh Penguins. No, it's it's uh, it's there's six teams left. Uh, when we last did a podcast, this playoffs were just starting, and we kind of went through some of the teams that we thought could go far. Has anybody surprised you of these six teams that are remaining? I'm pretty sure I know who you're going to say. Nashville, yeah, uh, incredibly surprised the way they beat Anaheim I, in seven games. I believe they won three games in Anaheim. They were down three two. Yeah, I did not expect Nashville to get out of the first round, let alone compete for, you know, in Game 7 uh, to get to the conference final. Um, they're a good team, and they play well together. We didn't see them a lot, or I don't remember seeing them. It was, you know, very nondescript games against yeah. them, if memory serves. But they're a good the team. The Coyotes were 2-1 and one against them. I like San Jose before the playoffs even started. I just think Joe Pavelski is such an underrated player. Am I getting too far ahead of myself? No, here? he's the third... If you go back to the 2011-12 season, uh, now I can't ask this as a question because I already gave away the answer, but he is the third highest scoring player in the NHL in those five years. It's wow. Ovechkin one, Stamkos two, Joe Pavelski three. Wow. I think Coyotes fans appreciate it because you see him a lot. I was just going to say, we get to see Joe Pavelski a lot, so it's easy to recognize how talented he is. Uh, I don't think you know he gets a lot of recognition in the Eastern Conference, up in Canada. But, boy, he's really having a coming-out party, if that even makes yeah. sense for Joe Pavelski. It's, it's crazy because, again, the numbers I just threw at you, and he plays for Team USA in the Olympics. But you're right. He, it was interesting. Chicago, L.A., and New York all go out in the first yeah. round. And uh, you you had San Jose over L.A. I remember that. And and I thought very highly of San Jose. I remember saying if they weren't playing L.A., I'd pick them to go far. Right. They get past L.A., they, they may lose to Nashville. We don't know. But to have New York, who wins an, an average of two playoff series every year, and they, they've got some issues now. And then Chicago, who wins the cup every other year, go out. And L.A., who wins it every other year. Yeah. Uh, all of a sudden, you've got this setup heading into the second round where there's all these – new storylines which i think is great for the sport and i tell you what one of the ones that has really emerged 
uh, just from talking to former players or people around the game, a lot of people want to see Joe Thornton go far. A yeah. lot of people do. I don't know if you caught Shane Doan on the NHL Network. He's another one. Uh, he came right out and said exactly what you just said. They asked him, you know, who you're rooting for, who do you think's going to win, and right away he went to big uh, Jumbo Joe and said, you know, he's a good guy. He deserves it. Yeah. Uh, he's playing great, too. San Jose, Nashville, that's an interesting series. The other one, uh, Dallas and St. Louis. My goodness. Yeah, what a the, series. By the time you hear this, probably, because that game starts in like an hour, yeah. uh, you're going to know who won. But that when you don't have a rooting interest in a series, you want to see it go seven yeah. games. And then specifically St. Louis and Dallas, because yeah. they're so good, but they're so different the way they play. And so it's going to be – is it going to be the more physical and I don't I don't want to say motivated, but a St. Louis team that's been trying to get over the hump for the last 10 years, it feels like they finally beat Chicago. They don't want to now go out in the second round or Dallas, who in a lot of ways just kind of says, we're just going to score and see if you can score with yeah. us. It's a whole different style of sure. hockey and it's fun. Eastern Conference. I've been impressed by Pittsburgh. I'll just beat you to the punch here. I spent the first round of the playoffs back east, so I didn't get to watch a lot of the Western games because I was asleep when they came yeah. on. I don't know how those people back so there I watch. I couldn't live in the – well, yeah. I stay up late enough to watch it anyway, but still, some of those triple overtime games. It's crazy, let me tell you. But anyway, so I got to watch Pittsburgh – versus the Rangers. Boy, that was a dismantling of a yeah. very good team. Uh, and then Pittsburgh comes in, and they just uh, they beat Washington in six games. It's, I don't think anybody predicted that. No. It's just Pittsburgh has really impressed me over the last month here in the postseason. Uh, that line of um, Kessel and Benino and is it? Carl Hagelin. Carl Hagelin. It's not, I mean, it's not Malkin or Crosby it's that's not. winning them games. And their goalie's a rookie Yeah, thrust in there by injury. So mm, yeah. it, They've just been very impressive. I think they might go all the way now. I'm usually a West Coast, Western Conference guy. Well, they usually win. The West does. <laughs> but seeing who's left in the West and who's left in the East, I, I don't think anybody's beating Pittsburgh. Uh, of course, we haven't even mentioned Tampa Bay, who just kind of steamrolled their way yeah. to the final, conference final. It's uh, Looking at the start of the playoffs, I remember thinking, not a knock on Tampa Bay, but everybody was concerned because they didn't have Stamkos or Anton Straubin, who are two pretty big pieces. My thought was still they get through the first two rounds because they – they had the, quote, easiest path. Sure, and the they Red absolutely Wings. Did. Yeah, the, the Red, Red Wings, Wings and then the Islanders or the Panthers, so not a lot of experience there. Uh, taking nothing away from those teams, but there are certain teams that it's a successful season to get to the playoffs, maybe win a series, and then there are teams like Washington that probably needed to make it at least to the Cup for it to be a successful season. Uh, so Tampa Bay, I mean, they went to the Cup last year, so they were able to take advantage of, of playing those teams. And also, they're pretty loaded. Like, they don't have Stamkos or Strawman. They may get one or two of them back here in this this. Uh, Eastern Conference Finals, so I wouldn't count them out by any means because they're the most experienced team because they just went to the Cup last year. But to your point on Pittsburgh, it's interesting. It's not like Crosby and Malkin have disappeared, they're, but they're not scoring a lot of goals. They're really not. And so what happens if they do start scoring goals? Exactly. And I think for Pittsburgh, they got the toughest second-round draw playing Washington, obviously. They won the President's Trophy. And probably the first. Yeah. In that conference, at least. I oh, mean, yeah. the Rangers, uh, that's an excellent team. And they really just drove. I could tell you, I was watching with my brother, a Rangers fan, and he was turning it off midway through the second period. He'd seen enough. and that's, I don't blame him. <laughs> it was hard to watch for Rangers games fans. Games four and five, it didn't even feel like the Rangers were there. So as we sit here now, what we know, there's six teams left. Obviously, that's going to change in a few hours. But let's just see who do you like now that is pared down. It's, it's tough to pick a team out of the West to win the Cup just because there's four of them left. Yeah. Uh, I will tell you, when the second round started, I, I felt pretty confident that it was going to be Tampa, St. Louis, San Jose, and I had no idea who was coming out of Pittsburgh. Washington, because Pittsburgh was the hottest team, and yeah. I think the deepest Penguins team I've seen since they won the Cup. Yeah. Maybe even deeper, actually, than that team, but Washington is a great team. So that one, I was just 50-50, flip a coin or whatever. Uh, and I will say... I kind of feel bad for Washington. And you know I'm from Pittsburgh, so I was pulling for Pittsburgh. But it's tough to see a guy like Ovechkin sitting on the bench when, yeah. they, when they lose in overtime and Braden Holtby laying on the ice because that's a good team, and you've got to wait 12 months to get back. To sure, and expectations were so high for them in their market and in their room, I presume. you know, yeah. They were expecting this to be the year they finally shook off that label of chokers in the playoffs. And they didn't really choke. They, they I mean, didn't. They, they just played a better team. Those two teams could have met in the Stanley Cup, potentially, if they were on, you know, if one of them was a Western Conference team. Let me rephrase. They played a team that played better in that series. Yeah. So. yeah. And maybe the only team that's playing better than Washington right now. I don't know. And all those wins were one-goal games. So who are you picking? I'll go, I'll go San Jose, St. Louis, if you don't break your giant desk. <laughs> San Jose, St. Louis in the West. Um, and, boy, 
I just haven't seen enough of Tampa. But if Pittsburgh plays to their potential, I do think they're better than Tampa. So I'll go with Pittsburgh. So you're picking Pittsburgh in the East, as am I. Okay. And who's coming out of the West? If it's San Jose, St. Louis. No, no. There's four teams left. Well, who are you picking out of the West? San Jose. Are you? I want to pick San Jose. I'm do really it. disappointed that they couldn't come out of that. What's I, keeping you from picking them? Because I've watched Nashville closely in these playoffs because they're always the late game. Oh, you don't think they're even going to get by Nashville? Well, I just – I'm going to go San Jose. I will pick San Jose. No, you know what? I'll take St. Louis. Wow. I'll take St. Louis. This is hard to watch. No, I'll take Dallas and Nashville too. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's The West is so wide open. So you took St. Louis against Pittsburgh. Yeah. Okay. I'm going Pittsburgh, San Jose. We'll see you in a few weeks. Can I say this? It feels like San Jose's year, but it also felt like Washington's year. And obviously it wasn't. Um, what else we got here? Well, you've got a little quick announcement for well, us. Well, yeah, I just wanted to remind the Coyotes fans listening that uh, this Saturday at uh, Gila River Arena, a big event um, from 2.30 to 4 p.m., it's an open house. So May 14th. So in case you hear this next week, don't come out on May 21st. Great point. Saturday, May 14th, 2.30, 4 p.m., here at the arena. Mike Smith's going to be here, and he's going to play ball hockey with the kids. Nice. That's reason enough to come. Yeah, just to see the the goalie playing ball hockey. I don't know if he's going to play goal or if he's going to play out or whatever. But, yeah, it'll be a, a cool event for the Coyotes fans. I like anything that promotes hockey 12 months. Or I don't want any or any sort of off season. I think, I, I like I told you a couple of weeks ago when we did the show, I've whittled the off season down to about eight days mentally. And now I think we're down to about six. Does that include showers and meals? a good point so really the off- if you just take a lot of showers there's no off season so full details on this event can be found at arizona coyotes.com and Luke, i believe that's it that clears the board from the pre-podcast meeting which lasted about 45 40 seconds. seconds i would say 40 somewhere in that range dave actually has a board though i gotta say a whiteboard uh, he wrote on it with permanent marker which was <laughs> enjoyable before the show but yeah we had we had a pretty extensive list for a podcast in the middle of may and I gotta say, we're probably gonna have another. The next podcast we do is probably gonna be loaded too with the way uh, this off season is going. But for Dave Best, uh, for executive producer Doug Cannon, I'm Luke Lipinski. Thanks for listening to Coyotes Corner.